everyone, it's Matt and Pat from RAM, and today we're going to look at some of our single disc units meant for the racing applications. Um, we're going to touch on some of the features of each particular unit and why we've got so many options. We're also going to touch on how you decide which one best fits your application. Okay, Matt, well starting out here with the first unit, we call this our Red Hat RAM assembly. This is kind of a great entry level unit to get started into a single disc drag racing application. It's got a stamped steel cover, built aluminum pressure ring build aluminum flywheel and again we like in all these systems here we have a 5135 center iron clutch disc. Moving over to our second unit is a billet 10 inch long style assembly. It's very similar to the Red Hat, it's a three lever design um, but the cover is CNC billet machined so a little more precise in its fitment. Also the Red Hat unit has a stand or lug driven pressure ring so the pressure ring actually drives off the cover where you can see on the 10 inch billet long, we actually have a stand driven assembly. So it's a little bit stronger, it's going to hold up a little bit better. Uh, the other good feature of the 10 inch unit is that it will fit in applications where the bell housing clearance is a little bit tight for like a 130 tooth Chrysler or a 157 tooth Ford application, possibly like in a quick time bell housing. Uh, moving on from here, we move into our Low Pro series. Here we've got the 10 inch Low Pro, and this unit has six levers instead of three like the earlier two. Uh, same spring configuration to adjust that, but the advantage to having the additional levers is you're spreading out the pressure load around the pressure ring a little bit further, making the clamping a little bit smoother, a little easier on the engagement, and uh, actually wears the clutch disc a little bit nicer and develops a little bit better wear pattern. Um, then moving up from the 10 inch low pro, which we would, we would go to the 8 inch low pro, it's the same configuration, uh, six lever units, six pressure springs. Again, very good wear pattern, good even clamping across the pressure ring. Um, great for small block applications in, in drag racing. You know, something I want to go back to, Pat, is you mentioned the Red Hat and the 10-inch billet. Now, this basically, I like to call this basically the Red Hat on steroids. We basically redesigned a lot of the features that we were kind of missing out with the Red Hat regarding, like you said, the lug-driven uh, pressuring, but also why don't you touch on the way the pressuring is designed regarding the lever placement over the pressuring. Okay, so on the Red Hat unit, this is actually based around the 11 inch pressure ring, although we use a 10 inch centered iron disc in here. So the pivot point is a little bit further out on the pressure ring. When we move down to a 10 inch, we actually move the pressure point in on the pressure ring to center it up a little bit better to get a little more even wear on the clutch disc. Um, a lot of companies will take a 11 inch plate and turn it down to 10 inches, but they don't relocate that lever pin location, so you're pushing very, very far on the clutch disc and not getting good even wear or contact. So I noticed you talked about the six lever low pro version uh, compared to the uh, billet and the Red Hat three lever version. So you kind of touched on the fact of why the, there is a benefit to the six levers versus the three, but why don't you also touch on some of the key points as to how we ultimately help the customer decide on which one best fits their application. Well, kind of jumping back over to just discuss a little bit more on the low pro. So we talked about the 10 inch built long being, being stand driven. And we have the same features located on both the low pro units, although we use a larger stand bolt. We've got a half inch stand bolt, an 875 diameter stand versus a half inch or a three quarter inch stand and a three eighths bolt on the 10 inch stuff. Um, so this unit's just got a lot more rotational strength. These two units also are set ring height, which we'll touch on a little bit, are set by shims, where the two low pro units actually have an adjustable stand where you can set that ring height. Now all of these units actually use a segmented pressuring and segmented flywheel. So um, tell us the reason why we use a segmented unit versus a one-piece heat shield like we do on some of our other uh, uh, products we offer. Well, a segmented insert for the most part will expand and contract and allow the aluminum to expand and contract without distorting the insert. The steel and, and the aluminum do not expand and contract at the same rate so a lot of times when you have a one-piece insert it's stretching that steel insert and it's causing it to curl up and warp and not stay flat that's really a problem on particularly the three lever units you see a lot more of because you're only pushing down in the three pressure points plus the six springs the more members you add that seems to be less of an issue so that leads me to uh, another question i get asked a lot i've already got an aluminum flywheel um like a 2501 for example um our, our chevrolet flywheel it's got a one-piece heat shield uh, I get asked pretty regularly, can I put or retrofit that with a Red Hat RAM? Um, what are the pros and cons to doing that? Okay. And can you do it? Yeah, a Red Hat RAM will go right onto like a standard 2501 GM flywheel, which has a one-piece insert. Um, it would be better to use part number 2501 SG, which has a segmented insert. 
or possibly get your 2501 retrofitted for the segmented insert. But this unit will bolt on the um, cover attachment points are all the same. The 492 stud set will allow you to do that with a 550 shim kit. So the only issue I see based on what you said earlier is that it would bolt onto it, but the reliability, longevity, and the repeat, repeatability of it could very well be compromised because of it not being able to dissipate the heat properly. It will be slightly compromised because it will try to pick on the insert over time, but it, it still will work. Okay, so if you do have a 2501 uh, and somebody's going to consider a Red Hat, they can have their 2501 retrofitted with a segmented style heat shield. Yes, that's, we do that quite, quite frequently. Okay, great.
So we've covered so many different topics on the units, Pat, that we've really got one more important area of the clutch that we haven't touched on yet, and that's the throw-out bearing. So we've got a couple of units on the, on the corner of the bench there, so why don't you uh, run us through some of the differences between those units. Okay, Matt, so starting at the beginning, this is kind of our traditional throw-out bearing we have here. Uh, this is our part number 479. It's very popular to be used with the Red Hat unit. Um, we machine this collar and house and then press a, a standard type automotive release bearing onto it. Um, it works very well, although it does have some, some issues over time, the wear and things of the bearing will get a little bit loose in the collar there, but it, it does function pretty well. Um, more recently, we've designed this kind of upgraded version of the bearing where it's the same type of machine collar, but it actually comes apart. And it's got, inside of here, we've got a bearing with a tool steel face on it, and this bearing springs, sp spins very freely. Uh, when you go to push the clutch in at the finish line, the bearing's not turning, and the engine's turning eight or 9,000 RPM, maybe more. So that bearing's got to ramp up to speed. And this bearing does a very good job of that, and it's got a very good wear resistance. And then on top of it, there's no internal grease that can get slung out of that and get into the clutch assembly itself or even possibly down onto the clutch disc. So that, that's a really trick part that we're pretty happy with. Um, moving up from there, um, a lot of cars are moving to billet clutch forks that have two uh, locating pins. And this is what we call an anti-rotational collar uses the same type bearing we just looked at. It's got the tool steel bearing with the pop-on face. It spins very freely. Uh, the only difference here is this bearing stays perfectly located inside the belt housing. The, the billet fork actually has, a, instead of having a pivot ball, has a heim joint that it rotates on, so there's no moving around on the pivot ball. So the engagement and disengagement of the clutch is very positive. So, and with all these units, we're also also able to offer different uh, length collars because something that we get asked about a lot of times uh, either on email or phones is how do I really set the bearing up correctly in my bell housing in relationship to the fingers? So, um, you know, the bearing obviously operates the, the levers, um, but why don't we talk about a little bit how important it is to have the proper distance uh, and proper fork geometry to make sure we operate the clutch correctly. Yeah, so when we're setting this up initially, Matt, we're going to want to have about a quarter inch clearance between the face of the throttle bearing and the, and the levers themselves. And again, if you maintain that ring height, you're going to consistently keep that clearance that you need. Uh, once you lose that clearance and the clutch starts to wear, the ring height's not maintained, you can actually get against the throttle bearing and unload the clutch prematurely. So we definitely want to set that um, dimension correctly. The bearings, we do have them in a variety of sizes depending on what depth bell housing you have to make that fit correctly. And, and the reason why we want that uh, clearance between the face of the bearing and the fingers is because as you start adding the counterweight on any of these units, um, the levers actually start to move towards uh, the bearing and actually apply the pressure ring. That's how we obviously uh, adjust the amount of force that the clutch has, correct? Right, and that, and that coupled with the clutch disc wearing, so that when that clutch disc wears on a run, when that initial slip takes place, that lever is going to move back all by itself just for the wear of that run. Now, again, we've got a lot of, uh, you know, cool pieces here. Now, when and where might you consider a dual disc uh, unit, something, uh, something in the, well, you know, the same vicinity here? All these units are available in two and sometimes three disc uh, assemblies. Um, these right here, we're kind of targeting single disc systems. A lot of these fit in stock depth bell housings, maybe a liquid bell housing or a quick time. But if you have a deeper bell housing, uh, we certainly can build you a, a two or a three disc unit to go in there as well. Now, when to use one? Uh, when the horsepower level starts to increase and you start to go above a thousand horsepower, the dual disc unit tends to start to want to win out just because you have more surface area to spread the heat across and the engagement of the clutch can be a lot smoother with the more friction. When you add more friction to the clutch system, the easier the engagement is going to be. It's kind of like adding pressure members in the low pro units. Just more surface area is just going to make the clutch a little more friendly. So, and uh, kind of like everything else we do, it's really important for us to get the proper information from the customer to really figure out which one of these might be right for their application, or again, perhaps maybe a step up to the dual disc. Exactly, and I, I think one of our philosophies here at RAM is we, much like buying shoes, we don't want to buy a clutch that's too small for what we need. We want to buy something that we have a little extra capacity built into so that we're not pushing the envelope all the time and so we can get a good service life out of it. So we've got a lot of great options here when it comes to the single disc unit. Um, it's really important for the customer. It's definitely not a one size fits all. So it's really important for the customer to get us the right information. So um, what's the best way for a customer to get started in uh, getting us that information, Pat? Matt, the best way is probably to reach out on our website on our eTech form at ramclutches.com. Uh, you can get the vehicle specifics communicated over to us. We can take a look at it and then we can reach back out to you to kind of start the process of what clutch is going to be best for you. 
So like Pat said, we're just an email or a phone call away. Don't ever hesitate to give us a call. We're always happy and uh, eager to help you guys.